Hello, everybody. Welcome to IST 110. I'm, of course, Professor S, and this is today's lecture. There we go. All right, so first thing we're going to talk about is email etiquette. So um, if you're a freshman this year, you well, actually, like considering how remote uh, some of your classes have probably been, you've probably uh, more familiar with email uh, than you would be if we were in, in residence. Uh, but the thing is, it's like, Prior to coming to college, you probably didn't use too much email. Um, and the thing is, is like once you graduate, you will uh, continue to use email even more so. And so it's kind of understood right now that you're kind of still learning. But when you get in the working world, you're going to be uh, expected to be able to um, understand uh, email etiquette. And so that's some of the things that we're going to kind of uh, go over here. So first is keeping it short. Uh, oftentimes, uh, people who read email do not have a passion for reading email, so to help them be happier with reading your emails, it's often encouraged to keep it short. Don't do, go into lengthy responses, just get to the point. Help them out. <laughs> um, another thing, too, is getting to key points first. Uh, don't go into lofty background stories, just get to whatever you're talking about. Kind of goes in with the last one. Think about the recipients. What sort of information would they know? What sort of things um, would they care about finding out? All those sort of things are things that you need to think about. Um, maybe also thinking about like the appropriateness of how you want to send something. Like so, for instance, um, is the, if this is a professional relationship that you're uh, emailing somebody about, then you probably don't want to use a uh, an emoji. Okay. Emojis are very familiar, and so if you're looking for a professional, it might not be the best place for one. But that's part of knowing your recipients. Keeping threads separate. So one that kind of goes along the lines of when you're replying to a things like a reply all, and you have, um, say, you include information from another email. So it's just being mindful of what you're including in which email who's all reading it, that sort of thing. Make sure you also check spelling because um, that's important. And then also don't email angry. The thing is, is like once you send an email, you can't unsend it. So um, just make sure you don't uh, do something rash. And that kind of goes along with assume uh, it's public because the thing is, it's like you can't delete emails and maybe somebody can show your email off to somebody else. So you just have to accept the possibility that somebody... Um, might look at your email other than the recipient. So also with that said, be careful of humor. Not all humor translates, especially sarcasm. Sarcasm uh, can be lost very easily and come off, uh, come off as angry in an email. So um, be mindful of what you have and rule of thumb, don't include any of it. Um, Another thing that I found to be useful is include use the subject to describe the email. Let the person know what they're about to read before they open up your email. It helps them determine the urgency of opening up your email. Also, include action items at the end. So you talk about different things, make sure you tell them there's different things that you want. So like for instance, if it's an extension that you want, make sure you ask for an extension. Don't just say, hey, I'm having all these issues and then nothing, then they have to guess, like, what are you asking? Just tell them what you're ask what you're looking for. That's, um, and I, I mean, you need to do it with tact, but the thing is, is like, it's very, it you're eating up somebody's time by not getting to the point in that matter. So just include action items. Like this is, um, so like summarizing the email and saying like, so this is what I need from you. I, I want to, uh, I need more time working on this project or um, I just wanted you to know or things like that. So you're just, they understand. So the person reading the email doesn't have to figure out also what they need to do with this information. Okay. All right. Now what we're going to talk about is intellectual property. There's many different flavors of intellectual property. The three we're going to focus on are copyrights, trademarks, and patents. And the thing that I want you to take away from this is being able to identify uh, each one of these right? So that if you come across one out in the wild, 
you can say, oh, that's a trademark, or oh, that's a copyright, or oh, that's a patent. Okay. So copyright, first of all, grants the creator or owner of the original work exclusive rights to utilize and authorize use of the work. So they can sell it, they can do whatever they want with it, including licensing it out to other people so they can uh, make money off of it or whatever, right? The thing is, is that it does have a shelf life. The shelf life could change depending upon, well, what year, <laughs> what year it is, because sometimes the shelf life changes over time. Um, sometimes uh, it also depends upon who owns it or the type of thing. But the thing is, it's like, um, there is a shelf life. It does go up. And when it does, it goes in the public domain where anybody can use it. Um, anyway, so copyright can be owned by a company or a person, right? And fair use allows limited use of copyrighted uh, materials without receiving permission uh, from the rights holder. So fair use is a very common thing that people like to cite as being something that allows them to do something. But the thing is, is like fair use is determined by courts not by individuals, right? So think about it this way. So like there's, oh, here's one. There's a rumor that, or a, um, a myth that if you just use 30 seconds of a song, then you will, you don't have to pay royalties on it. Like it's free. And that's not the case. Um, fair use is not determined by a rule like that. It's determined by the courts. Courts are given a um, an issue and they make a determining if it's fair use or not, right? So it's not, uh, there's like some general uh, rules of thumb that people have used to suggest fair use, but those are just things that have, um, people have not necessarily gone to court for or court has generally ruled on. It doesn't necessarily guarantee that you, like following those best practices for fair use, doesn't guarantee that you're uh, not violating some sort of copyright issue. It's just going off of probability, okay? So the only people that can really determine fair use are judges. Uh, Creative Commons license enables free distribution. These are copyrights that um, are established to allow people to distribute, um, to allow other people to distribute uh, as they want. Like, for instance, Unsplash allows people to distribute their pictures and things like that as long as they cite where they got it from. So com Creative Commons doesn't mean you could do whatever you want. So you can't just say, hey, this is mine now and start selling it to people. That's not what that does. That just says you can use it. I, like I could use that in a thumbnail for a YouTube video or I could use it in a slide or whatever. A trademark is a recognizable mark that can be used to represent an individual or business and it's legally owned by the individual or business. Um, so think about this as being something that's tied to a brand because that's usually like what it's, it's, it's being used for. So this could be a, a logo, this could be a, a design, it could be a color, it could be anything that when people see, they associate it with your brand. Right? So it's things that are tied to your brand. And so that's something that's very important to a company or an individual because when people think of that person, it's the their relation to that brand that helps them, right? So thinking of Disney as a family company is an important part of its brand, right? So it needs to monitor how its marks are being used to make sure like it's being used uh, uh the way they want it to be. And the way they want it to be is to be kind of associated with a family uh, friendly environment sort of thing. Now, uh, most of the trademark things that I've talked about are tied to visual things, but it's not necessarily the case. So trademarks could be uh, smells. They, I mean, visual things, of course, um, but it also, I mean, I guess it could be taste, but um, so like an example of a smell would be like the Abercrombie smell is probably trademarked, right? So if you've ever walked in a mall and passed by an Abercrombie and Fitch, maybe maybe you didn't even see the Abercrombie and Fitch uh, store when you're passing it, but you definitely noticed it with your nose because <laughs> you were assaulted uh, by your nose <laughs> that there was an Abercrombie and Fitch store there, then you know that um, like that's, that's something that's tied to its brand, okay? 
Now, the thing is, is that it's not required to register, uh, but it's a generally considered a good idea because it helps protect you in the future. Okay. But another thing too is owners hold on to marks as long as they are in use. So one of the, you've kind of probably seen this before because whenever you see a brand do something as a throwback version, it's usually so that they can, well, not a hundred percent. So they couldn't, maybe it's, um, does, uh, in, like they are tapping into a nostalgia thing, but it's also to hold on to their trademark um, so that they could still use it because they're still selling things with that logo or with that mark associated with their product. And a patent is a government license that allows an inventor or device or an inventor of a device or process to exclude other manufacturing, distributing and profiting from an invention. One of the easiest examples of this is drugs. So drug companies will uh, put all this research and development into developing new drugs, and they want to make sure that they have exclusive exclusivity in producing and selling that drug for a time period, right? Because the idea is, it's like, what's the point of research and developing a drug if other people can just uh, um, make it themselves without doing the, the research, right? Research takes time and money. Those, um, the people in the labs with the white coats, scientists, they have doctors, <laughs> they're not cheap, right? So the thing is, it's like, we need to make sure or that um, it's been established that there's these things called patents to help protect people so that they can, these, like for instance, these drug companies can make these drugs for a certain amount of time before other people can have a go at it, okay? So um, that's why when new drugs come out, there's no generics because the patent doesn't allow other people to make it. Okay, generics are those cheaper versions coming in and making it without having to pay for the research and development. Um, so a couple of things with the patents is that invention must be disclosed to the public. So essentially how it's made and all that stuff has to be available. So if this is something that you don't think somebody can reverse engineer, it might be a good idea not to patent it. I don't know. The thing is, it's like you're going to want to talk to a lawyer if this if you're considering filing a patent because they're going to know way better than me because that's something they specialize in. Um, law is a fickle, fickle creature, and you want to talk to somebody that specializes in it so that you're not um, messing yourself up. Anyways, an invention must be new, non-obvious, and undisclosed uh, to the public prior to application being submitted. So that means you can't... Uh, just submit something that's already been invented. It has to be new, right? And it can't be something obvious. Like it can't be, um, I don't know, a, uh, like, let's say it's a, like a pencil, um, but maybe you included a different color of, like, or you included a pen cap for it. It hadn't been done before, but it's just like, why are you putting pen caps on pencils? It's it's kind of it's it's not that uh, non obvious of a thing. Um, and an obvious thing would be if there was no such thing as a mechanical pencil, and then someone came up with one. That would be a uh, non obvious one. And uh, undisclosed means that it can't be something that's been um, that just hasn't been registered. It's just it's it's got to be new. All right. So anyways, as I promised before, I'd give, I talk about some tools and then at the end of the lecture, I gave some people some time to work on it. Um, and I'm going to just fly through it. So one of the things that you have access to as a Penn State student is Adobe Creative Cloud. If, um, and so the things that could be helpful for you are Photoshop, Illustrator, Premiere Pro, or Premiere Rush. It's like they're both uh, film editing software. It's just one is used by professionals and the other is much easier to for a um, for somebody to pick up and go. Okay, Premiere Pro is has a learning curve to it. and It takes some time, but if you just want to edit it, some videos uh, very quickly, Premiere Rush could be your thing. The other thing is, is like you just can't do as much in Premiere Rush as you can do in Premiere Pro. Think about it. It's kind of like maybe you've you are familiar a little bit with Photoshop. Premiere Rush is more like Microsoft Paint and Photoshop is more like Premiere Pro. I think I might have backed those up. 
Rush is like Paint. Uh, Pro is like Photoshop. There you go. Um, so there's definitely a learning curve that goes into it, and it takes a little bit to know, but you can definitely do more with it. Uh, character animator, this could be a tool that could be used for, for you. This is where you do simple animations, and it's, it's another thing that pros can use as well. Addition, I believe that's audio editing software that you have access to. And so all these are part of the Adobe Creative Cloud, and there's also more. I just, these were ones off the top of my head. Oh, After Effects, that's another one that's also available on Creative Cloud. And like I said, this is free to our students. So if you didn't know, and you want to get into some of this stuff, go ahead and try, because you're it's, it's, it's part of your tuition, uh, and enjoy it. Um, but maybe you don't know how to use it. Well, fortunately, a lot of people do, and they make videos of it on LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning, which you also have access to with being a Penn State uh, student. Um, so if you want to learn something about that's related to using a computer, whether it's any Adobe products, uh, programming in any language, um, all these different things you have access to through LinkedIn Learning. Another thing to think about is YouTube. Um, since like things like Premiere Pro and Photoshop are used all the time by a lot of different people, there's a lot of how-tos on YouTube for them. Probably Illustrator and Character Animator and maybe Edition as well, uh, because Creative Cloud is a very popular thing with um, inventors. In fact, most uh, of the bigger budget YouTube videos that you watch are probably done with uh, Premiere Pro. For recording, Something that you could do to get, uh, if you can't get everybody available, is you could use Zoom and PowerPoint together. So you do a Zoom meeting and record it and have PowerPoint with people talking over it. And then you have yourself a uh, video. Um, if you're actually recording videos and you need camera equipment, like people are on campus, and that's actually is only for people on campus, is like it's possible for you to borrow um, technology through the Media and Technology Support Services at the Wagner Annex. So this is at a building or a location behind the Wagner building um, and it's reservations only but it's it's something that should be available to you. You just have to make that reservation. Look it up and they'll be able to help you if you need cameras, lighting, microphones, any of that stuff. If you need it. Then some recording tips. So make sure, like with your cameras, you want to make these about eye line. And to kind of illustrate what that is, you want to um, <laughs> you want the the camera to be up at um, like so that if you're sitting up straight and your your neck is straight, that the camera is about that eye level looking at you. That's about where you want it to be. You don't want to be hunched over. Um, usually, a camera down low is not the most flattering. Uh, uh, angle for a person, any person. Um, so it's often re recommended that you use uh, eye line cameras. Also make sure you have lighting uh, good so you're not in the dark and we can see your face. That's usually something that we want to see. Um, make sure like if you're using a microphone, you use it correctly. One of the common mistakes that I've seen students do wrong with uh, microphones is the headphones that come with phones, um, like an iPhone. There's that little piece that you can talk into, and what people will do is they'll put their mouth directly up to that uh, thing. And the thing is, up to the wherever the microphone is in that that part of the the strand. And the thing is, is like your micro that microphone isn't designed to be talked directly into. It's kind of off to the side, because the thing is, is it has your breath kind of uh, doing a peaking, or it's. Um, it's not anticipating, it, it's just not, it's not designed to work that way. And what it could do is peaking. And what that is, is like, if you think about the waves, it's going above the, um, the, the capabilities of it, um, of its recording. Anyways, it just doesn't, it's not the most flattering sounding. The one other thing that might help is using the rule of thirds. Maybe. This is just a basic composition for photography, where if you think about, if you divide horizontally the, um, the, the, divide, not horizontal, like, um, 
divide into thir the thirds. The um, I keep saying the same thing. But see, these are the thirds that I'm talking about. This third here and this third here. So this is a third, this is a third, this is a third. Like that's what I'm talking about. And so the importance for this is like your eye line should be about at that top third line. So if you look for it, that's like going to be where you kind of want to be. There's other composition rules, but I don't want to get into it. But anyways, I thought this might be helpful. Another reason why this is helpful is because you could be doing uh, interviews online. Um, and you want to kind of make yourself present well. And one of the ways that you could do this is by um, kind of doing these separate things. It kind of helps separate you from um, other people. It, it's a flattering thing that you could do for yourself. Anyways, um, that's all I have. Um, oh, I do have this one thing. Another thing is it's like you can use uh, royalty-free th things uh, as well. Just make sure you cite them correctly. Um, like on Splash.com, I talked about that earlier today. That's where you can get um, photographs. You just make sure you cite them correctly again. And YouTube offers um, a lot of royalty-free uh, music and things like that that could be useful as well. So just make sure you use them correctly. And if you have any questions about them, let me know. Anyways, that's it for now. Have a good uh, rest of your day and I'll see you all next Monday. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please press the like button that lets me know I'm doing something right. If you have any questions about any of the content, please send an email through Canvas to me and the rest of the teaching team and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Do not send it through normal email, you will not get as fast response. These are COVID times, so it could take a little bit, but we will get back to you, I promise. Anyways, if you have any suggestions for how I can make these videos better, please leave in the comments below. Don't forget to roundhouse kick the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified for when I post the next video. Anyway, I think that's good for now. I'll see you all next class.